Hello and welcome to Currency Cast. In this episode, the tables are turned as I am interviewed by Guillaume Jouvas and Hussam Ali from the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. I had a fantastic conversation with the two as we discussed all things currency management. Expect to learn today about different instruments and strategies when managing currencies, how risk affects different industries, the life cycle of an FX denominator transaction, and a case study to show you how it all works. And now to get started. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Hey, Augustine, thanks a lot for joining the podcast. And um, can we maybe begin with you introducing yourself and explain us what you do? Well, hey there, it's great to be here. My name is Austin McKinley. I'm the senior financial writer at Cantox and the host of Currency Cast. And I'm really excited to be here today to, to talk about all of this. Very excited as well. And I already heard quite some terms that I can't wait to break down. Augustine, thank you so much for coming on. So let's let's get into the nitty gritty, Augustine. So you mentioned a few times currency management. Could you define currency management as seen by Cantox? Right. Yes. Excellent question. Well, look, currency management is the process of of using foreign currencies in commercial and also financial operations. Commercial operations, as I just mentioned, right? If you're going to to sell in overseas markets, in Canadian dollars, in Thai baht, in Brazilian reais, then exchange rates and currencies are going to be involved. Or if you sell in domestic markets, but say you sell in British pounds, furniture that you imported from China, it's going to involve the Chinese currency, British pound. The, the entire process starts with pricing, but as I said, there is also the risk management a part of, of all this, it's not the only, it's the only, not the only one, right? People tend to put the, uh, uh, to give more importance to that risk management, which is, of course, very important, but it's not the only one. There's going to be also the process of payments and collections in, uh, in foreign currencies. And all of that, uh, must be included in what we call currency management. Do you define those differently between risk management and currency management, Augustine? Well, yes. As I said, pricing with an FX rate is a key component in currency market. In currency management, we've got to see some, some examples, I think, uh, a little bit later on. And the, the process of risk management also is usually understood as, as executing hedges. And of course, we need to define what that means. But at Cantos, we have a maybe a, a, a broader view of, of all that process. So, for example, there are all ways to manage risk, the underlying risk in currencies without executing hedges, and all of that is got to require a slightly, maybe, different approach that, that the one that is emphasized, right, mostly executing those, those uh, currency hedges. And so it involves more uh, more processes, more possibilities. In, in fact, it's a world of opportunity that opens up for treasures, again, to act more as strategic players within the company and allowing the, the firm to, yes, to take advantage of those, those currencies to maybe enhance the firm's competitive position and why not securing budgeted profit margins and even perhaps making a contribution towards well, enhancing the value of the firm. Why not? Now, very clear. I'm looking forward to digging into that. I heard some words that uh, Guillaume and I and our listeners love, like hedging. This is a it's a hot topic for us on the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. So, looking forward to touching that again. But before we get into that, could you give us some like examples of situations of where companies or corporates um, would use currency management exactly? Well, yes. Um, so say that uh, that. We're dealing with a, a U.S.-based company that uh, that has an order to to sell in, uh, say, a hundred thousand uh, euros worth of goods. But the key thing is that 
the, the settlement of that commercial transaction, right? Because it's a commercial transaction, is going to be, say, in three months' time. But what's going to happen? Between the moment the transaction is agreed and the moment it's got to be settled, that is, settled in gas, right? There's going to be a shift in the exchange rate. As we know, exchange rates change second by second, right? And so that is going to involve a, a number of processes and, of course, got to depend on the type of, of companies, the type of pricing characteristics, or some phase dynamic prices that change all the time. Some companies, on the other hand, would like to keep stable prices for say, an entire campaign or budget period, and others still decide to keep steady prices for as long as possible. So it's going to create different type of situations that we're going to re require or different types of currency management. I wanted to dig into the purposes of currency management. That it's, it's basically to enable international trade, right? As long as you have to deal with other territories, countries that have different currencies, not only will you need to exchange your own currency against or with the other one, but also hedge yourself against certain aspects of currency risk management, as you mentioned earlier. Pretty clear. Um, what are the instruments typically that we find in currency management and then currency risk management, Mark? Right. Well, yeah, um, I would add to what you just said that, yes, we are used to uh, think of currency management in terms of commercial uh, transactions, right? Mostly buying and selling goods and services and that you're perfectly uh, so right to emphasize that but there's the there could be a, a say a financial type of exposure to currency risk which is so for example a company makes a loan to subsidiary in a foreign currency and I, this is not a commercial type of, of transaction but it's going to to involve currency risk as well right? so there's commercial type of exposure and perhaps a more financial type of exposure. By the way, it's very exciting that right now we're starting to, to, um, to uh, get clients from the fintech space, fintech companies that fund themselves in one currency and issue loans in another currency, which also creates tremendous uh, so opportunities for them and for us to help them manage those currencies and that currency risk. Now, with regards to the tools that, that are used in currency management, well, I think most important ones involve the spot market operations, forward markets operations, but also options and why not uh, futures. Would you like to, to, to discuss those? Absolutely. Please, okay. let's dig into this. So what are the difference between uh, all of those instruments? How do you use them? And in which situations exactly? That's right. Look, a spot a transaction, as the name implies, is a transaction that is, uh, so for example, if I got to buy one currency uh, and paying in another one, that takes place, the settlement and the delivery take place on the spot, right? That's why it's called a spot market transaction. Now, it's not exactly on the spot. Why? Because it usually takes about two working days to be uh, to be settled, but mostly it's a spot market transaction. The delivery and payment take take place almost immediately. In fact, for euro against the dollar, which is the most widely traded currency pair, it, it, it takes only one working day to be settled and delivered. There are, of course, other types of uh, foreign exchange transactions that uh, help you manage currency risk and currencies in general, and the most widely used uh, here uh, for us and in the world is so-called forward market uh, foreign exchange uh, transaction. And they also involve a currency that is going to be sold against another one or bought against another one. But the key difference is that settlement and payment do not take place on the spot. They got to take place at a date in the future, right? That is that is agreed upon by both our participants. And that creates at least two important differences with a spot transaction. 
the moment, of course, time is involved, right? You, uh, you may agree to, to have delivery and payment take place two weeks' time, in a month's time, in six months, in one year. But the minute time is involved, interest rates are also involved. And that, uh, that is going to add some complexity to, uh, to an age. Also, you need to take the, your credit worthiness in, into consideration, right? An American president said, trust, but verify, right? In order for you to, to be able to execute such a forward a transaction, you need to make a good faith deposit, right? Call it a collateral amount that needs to, or cash that needs to be set aside in order to, to avoid a bad surprise this month. Makes a lot of sense. I like that the, the finance people have quite an understandable jargon, right? Spots, it's because it happened on the spots. Forward, you look forward to transaction. Makes a lot of sense. Super clear, Augustine. Thank you so much. Um, there's a couple more uh, financial instruments that we had covered before in Corporate Treasury 101. Um, so we, we talked about spots and forwards, but we also have mentioned things like swaps and options. Are those also used in currency management? And if so, how? Yes, absolutely. Because they're, they're used, uh, swaps and options are widely used. There's another one. Just let's briefly uh, break them uh, down all one by one. So a swap transaction is a transaction in which you buy and sell the same amount of a currency against another, but with different value dates. What's a value date? is the moment in time that a transaction is going to be settled. We saw that in spot market transactions, that is on the spot for what a transaction that takes place at a, at a date in the future. So swaps are very useful. So for example, if you have a forward transaction in place, say to buy a million euros against, a million dollars against euros, but you realize that you need in two days, say a hundred thousand dollars. Well, what you could do is here execute a swap transaction whereby there is what is called a near leg, in which you buy the hundred thousand dollars that you need for settlement in two days, and at the same time, you sell those hundred thousand dollars with the value date of the original position. And look at what, what you achieve. You're going to adjust your forward transaction right to the needs of the commercial hedging operation. And at the same time, you're going to have the cash at your disposal that you are going to need in, in, in two days time. Very, very useful type of transaction here, of course. There's, good, there, there's going to be a foreign exchange gain and loss depending on the change in the exchange rate. But still, it's a very, very useful type of operations. And, um, and we do that all the time. Options, on the other hand, it's, a, it's an altogether different animal, right? Yeah. When, um, when you have the option to buy one currency against another, well, as the name indicates, right, you, you, can, uh, you, can, you have the option to decide whether to go ahead or not with that transaction. And it's going to depend on, obviously, on the exchange rates on the day of the settlement. Is it too good to be true? Well, Yes, in a sense, it is. So that's why option buyers need to pay uh, what is called a premium to option. So it's a little bit like in a, a regular insurance policy. You have uh, the right to, to make a choice, but against that choice, you needed to uh, come up with, with a premium, a payment, right? Immediately uh, done. So maybe there's an issue here with options that we don't really, we don't do it at Captoff. We don't work with options. And it's the pricing of that premium, right? Of that right to decide whether or not to buy or sell. Well, it, it, it can be the result of complex mathematical calculations that sometimes, sometimes in situations where um, 
there is more complexities involved. Maybe it's not as transparent as forward our, our contracts are. So that's why we tend, well, well we don't use them uh, at Capitals. We are, we like to say uh, that, well, we are, we think forward, right? We, we use forwards uh, mostly and course and, and swap transaction. So is a, a swap is like if you had a forward already in place, but for some reason you need it earlier. So it's kind of like an emergency options contract. If you knew you needed it before, perhaps, or you had a higher risk of needing it before, you might have taken an option and paid for the premium. But a swap, would a swap then be more expensive than just getting an options every time? Or No, no. Well, why would you pick yeah. one over the other? Well, you're absolutely absolutely right to say that that the the swap allows you to to adjust your position and it's so useful in that case. Now we call that to draw on a forward, right? To yeah. use the the cash that you need. And why is it uh, because I'm so useful? It's because what you see on te in textbooks is, and of course the the settlement date of a commercial transaction by miracle exactly matches the settlement date of your corresponding forward transaction. Maybe we'll, we'll discuss that in more detail. Uh, but in real life, it's not the case, right? This, these adjustments need to be, to be executed. It's not always the case that the settlement of your commercial transaction exactly match the value date of your forward transaction. Now, the reason why we prefer swaps and, and forwards is most, mostly because of transparency. There is no, uh, the, the, the price is completely transparent. You can see that on Bloomberg, on Thomson Reuters, the information is widely available, whereas options are more of a uh, could be right, depending on their complexity, uh, involve a little bit less uh, less transparency than than we would like at least for our clients. Sorry. From what I understand of the, the different instruments you describe, would you rather uh, use like not flexible instruments and probably therefore a bit cheaper for payments on over which you have total control, and more flexible instruments for collections? Looking back to those swaps, because those collections can arrive at a different time than it was initially planned, right? So, is there such a thing in terms of strategy? And we're going to come to it, but hedging strategies or those that have nothing to do with it? Well, hedging strategies is a big one. We tend to, to use the term hedging programs at Cantox, but yes, yeah, yeah, and those hedging programs are going to go, as I said, uh, and, and so are going to include the on the faces, and the faces include payments and, and collections as well. But note, now uh, Guillaume, that forwards and swaps, so swaps it could involve spot and forward transactions, they could involve two forward transactions. And um, so they are, in our mind, is roughly the, the same instrument uh, that, that we're talking about, only with different value days. So, it's the one that we prefer. It's the one that we uh, tell companies to use. It's the most widely used of all by far, by the way, in, in terms of, of currency management. So we don't see there are enormous differences in payments and collections. We all always use uh, spot payments, forwards, and of course, those uh, swap transactions. Very clear, Augustine. Thank you so much. Can you take us further then into... As I mentioned at the start, our favorite topic, which is hedging and these hedging programs. So when we talked about hedging on Corporate Treasury 101, when Kim first explained it to me, talked about currency hedge, FX hedging and interest rate hedging. So focusing on the currency uh, or the FX hedging specifically, what are those hedging programs? And can you give us like examples from the real world? Th that's right. Well, look. Let, let's explain, if you will, a uh, 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 hedge here, relatively in, sim in, in relatively simple terms. A hedge is, to go back to that example of a U.S.-based company that has a um, so a real uh, um, on a sale in of a hundred thousand uh, euros, but the settlement is going to take place in three months' time. 
What you do is to hedge that transaction, that is to protect against the risk in that transaction, right? Transactional FX risk. But at the same moment, same date that you uh, that, that operation was closed or was agreed upon, what you got to do is you got to sell the same amount of euros in the forward markets. With what validate? With a validate that, if possible, matches the date of the settlement of the commercial transaction. And look at the magic that is going to operate here. What happens on the, on the date of the settlement of the two transactions? Because there's a commercial one, there's a financial one that you've got to do with, with a bank, right? You've got to get paid your 100,000 euros from the commercial transaction, and you're going to wire that amount to the bank, right? Against that amount, the bank is going to deliver your the value of uh, the corresponding value in US dollars. Note that that value was agreed upon as the transaction was also agreed upon. So there is no transactional currency risk other than the impact of interest rate differentials that we may discuss on a little bit later on. But also note that that allows us to define a hedge with more precision. The hedge is, in fact, it is the creation of a, or, or the, taking a financial position in a so-called derivative instrument, in this case, a forward currency contract, whose value is going to shift in exactly the opposite direction as the value of the commercial operation. So, for example, in this case, if at settlement, the exchange rate between the euro and the dollar goes down, right? There, uh, from a commercial point of view, you've got to get a what is called a, an FX loss, right? The commercial transaction, it, when translated back into dollars, is going to uh, uh, be of a lower value. But what happens when the value of your financial transaction there is going to go up in value because you sold it at a higher price? So is an offsetting impact that defines the precision of a hedge. Now, there are, of course, different, people call them strategies, or rather use the, the term programs, and mostly what they involve are, well, different types of programs according to the pricing characteristics of your business. Not, it's not the same if you're facing what we call dynamic prices or prices that are updated all the time, like in the travel or uh, in the travel space, right? OTAs, online travel agencies are going to face so prices that are second by second and they change all the time. Or a situation in which you wish to keep, say, a steady price, a fixed price on a catalog for one year. Say, or one budget period, or one campaign period, right? Could be uh, less or more than one year. And you have the ability to want to reset your prices at the onset of a new campaign. Still, another possibility is those firms that perhaps are competitive pressures need to keep their prices steady for more than uh, one or two campaigns. In fact, for as long as possible. And it's got to call for different hedging programs, and that's where things get, of course, a very, very exciting. Can you, in terms of stealing of hedging strategies, is there such a thing as hedging only a proportion of your commercial transaction? And by this, I mean, so the example you mentioned with the 100,000 USDs, could you hedge or like contract with the bank for what? Only for 50K, for instance, because of this pricing incentive that you don't want to pay too much for the cost of hedging, but you also want to have a little bit of certainty. Is there such a thing or that, that doesn't exist? Well, uh, Guillaume, this, you're just described the process of protecting a budget rate, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's what happens in, in budget. So maybe budget hedging is not the correct expression, but when you want to protect the, the entire budget for one year, you're going to do exactly as you're, you're implying. You're not likely, or at least we don't advise companies to take 
right at the start of the budget period ahead, right, for the entire budgeted forecasted demo. Why? Because it's going to create forecasting risk right here. What if COVID hits you in the midst of the, of the budget period, right? You will end up in this case being what is called overhead. You, you will have a large financial transaction, but your, the size or the value of your commercial transaction might be, in this case, on lower due to COVID or whatever, the economic crisis, etc. And that's exactly what, what we tell companies to do as they are going to, uh, to undertake a program to hedge their budgeted exposure. Now, very important that, um, because here, this is a fantastic example of the effects very much for citing it because it, it leads to the difference that we see in currency risk management and hedging. Let me, let me uh, explain this. So say that as just as you imply, you don't want to hedge the whole of the expected or, or forecasted budgeted exposure. But say maybe 20% of it or 40% right at the start. That's a, a prudent way to, uh, to deal with things. And it's got to, uh, to reflect your degree of forecasting accuracy, right? But you don't want high here. Neither so either to have the rest of the exposure completely left a possible fluctuations in currency. Well, what is that we advise companies to do then? then and we execute so our automated hedging programs. Well, then is to set for the remaining part of the budgeted exposure what is called conditional FX orders. I'm sure you've heard about conditional FX orders. They include so-called stop-loss orders and take-profit orders. In this case, what we're going to tell management is, look, for the remaining exposure that you didn't want, perhaps for very good reasons, to hedge 100% right at the start, let's put in conditional FX orders. How do we calculate them? Well, in such a way that say that you're going to divide the remaining exposure in three thirds, right? And so you've got to put three stop loss orders in place, right? such that if they are executed, if the market moves not in your favor, right? If so, there is a, say a worst case scenario in currency markets, the average of these three stop loss orders exactly matches your budget rate. Budget rate that you used in setting prices. So that's one way, you see, um, your mind goes on, uh, one way in which currency risk matters. Because we're managing risk here. Right? Not letting the company so have unmanaged, unmanaged exposure to currency risk. But we're not a necessarily executing hedges. We are uh, so monitoring markets, making sure that you're still actively managing your exposure to currency risk, but maybe not executing hedges all the time, but could be also for interest rate reasons pretty expensive. So, uh, and now we, I, mean, I get enthusiastic about this because look at what's going to happen there. You're going to get, as a treasurer, right? To the extent that this stop loss order, unexecuted, because markets maybe are not very volatile, perhaps they move in your favor. So, of course, uh, you could put also take profit orders, right? To take advantage of favorable moves. But to the extent that your stop loss orders are not executed, you gain time. And time, as I'm sure you, you've uh, uh, seen that in many talks with treasurers and with people in treasury, time is the most precious asset for the treasury team. This is going to give them the possibility to do a lot of things. One thing is, of course, to update, 
to fine tune, to improve their cash flow for. So as they do that, and they do that with the help of information that comes from real world, it's not just focus. Now they got to be able to see uh, what's going on in the economy, in the business, in the sales, in their purchases, and they're going to fine tune their focus. Now, as you fine tune your forecast to the upside or to the downside, you automatically adjust the level and the size of those conditions so that you make sure that the process improves as time goes by. Note also, and again, uh, so display my enthusiasm here. Note that also as time goes by, you might discover or find what is called netting opportunities. I'm sure we'll discuss that a little bit more, but netting opportunities is, hey, why would I execute a hedge if maybe a subsidiary has in a, a, a trade in the opposite direction? And even more to the point, but that involves a, a pretty technical point that is perhaps left uh, best left for uh, a little bit later on. There is the interest rate impact here. If interest rates are not in your favor, let's discuss that uh, in a couple of minutes, but here, delaying that hedge execution with the help of conditional orders is going to allow you to lower, to lessen the impact of those unfavorable interest rates. So lots of things are there to do, as, as you can see, depending on the, the type of, of strategy or program that you wish to implement. No, that that that's very apparent, Augustine. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, there's so many different strategies you can put in place, um, and you've taken us through lots of them. I'm sure there's way more. Um, does it? You you mentioned earlier about online travel agencies and how they um, have you know a certain need because of the environment that they're in. That raises the question of: Do industries have different strategies that are very common to them? largely around, like you mentioned, online travel agencies would be making transactions in seconds uh, in different currencies where factory, which is making one big bulk order of a certain raw material uh, every month, would have perhaps a different um, strategy in place. So how does it vary by industry? And what are perhaps the extreme cases on each yes. side? Yes, absolutely. Um, so a great point there. Uh, yes, it's the, I, in our view, the main point that that calls for different type of strategies or programs is we call it the pricing parameters of the firm. But pricing parameters might be a little bit uh, confusing, so let's call it the pricing characteristics of the firm. Do you face dynamic prices like the OTA, right? Or do you do you keep your prices steady for one campaign, right? Or do you Keep your prices so as steady as possible for as long as possible. That's the, the key element. Another element is the, the difference in interest rates, are, as we're going to explain a little bit later. But to go back to the example of the, of the travel sector, this is a fantastic one. It's perhaps the extreme one, right? In terms of dynamic prices. Now, there's geolocation services, payment apps, uh, algorithms that track demand and supply changes in seconds. That has uh, turned the prices in travel um, incredibly dynamic. They change really literally, literally minute by minute. So it's very important, very difficult there, or almost dangerous to to take a budget hedging approach such as the one I described a little bit earlier on, right? Because you would have the forecasting risk would be extremely uh, high. And you wouldn't you you would take perhaps too much too much risk. What we uh, do here is we advise companies to apply on what we call a micro hedging program for those firm sales or purchase orders. You could, for example, buy hotel capacity in Thailand and sell packages in in Canada. Right? It's got to involve uh, so. Currency risk on the buy side, currency risk on sell side. It's going to involve many times small transactions, right? And it's going to involve perhaps many 
different currency pairs. So that's almost, or that is impossible to, to manage manually. What you want here is to, what we call to aggregate those individual pieces of exposure. So that instead of executing a hedge for, say, a couple of thousand pounds or dollars to have a little bit more of an aggregation and then only you would execute the hedge. Note that this requires all the time that you are recalculate the, the value of that exposure with the new piece of, of information, new sales order or new purchase order that comes in. And it is absolutely possible to do it manually. You really need here the help of, of software tools to, to handle all of that. Super clear. And so linking to those software tools, um, I can see them also in more generally the currency management world. Who are the main actors, actually? You mentioned, obviously, the, the corporates who are in need of FX deals, right, to, for, to cover their commercial transactions. Who else is, is out there? Our corporations are on the by far the, say, the biggest users of currency management uh, solutions, both for the commercial type of exposure to currency risk, the national type of exposure, and but you could, could also mention currency dealers that have a, a very useful function in finding all those buyers and sellers that allow you to create a lively market. And in that regard, by the way, Young, there's an interesting development. Well, it's not new now, but it's uh, it has flourished in the past, say, uh, two or three years, and it's called the uh, we call them multi-dealer trading platforms, so it's just 360T. So what they enable you is to, to automate what we call the trade part, right? The execution of that forwards or spot or swap transactions. The treasuries now have the tool to automate all that uh, part of the process, right? The, the trading phase itself, thanks to those platforms. By the way, those platforms will give you, uh, will we'll have lots of features. One is them. One of them is called best price execution, which is really interesting because it's a uh, it's quite an, an amazing sign, right? When you see those currency rates fluctuating second by second, not only second by second, but also with the different banks that might have slightly different rates at which they buy and rates at which they sell. So the software uh, solutions there from those currency dealers or those multi-dealer training platforms automatically make sure if that's your if you're interested in getting the best price, you will get it. Not always. Uh, not everybody uh, wishes necessarily for the, the best price execution. For example, you would if you're doing business with a bank in other parts of the company, in, so we raising capital in in managing all the other parts of risk, take uh, interest rate risk or commodity price risk or whatever, you might want to channel your FX order to that particular institution, but you have the choice to do that. It's a way to automate all that uh, trade. And of course, banks are the, are the other side, the very uh, big players here, because what a bank has is, well, we know that, right? Contact with any money, a given amount of currency and others who want to sell that amount of currencies, of course they do that in money market instruments, in whatever, and in, uh, in equities and in on a spot basis, on a forward basis, on, a, on an options basis. So banks are very important here, of course, as they have all those contacts that enable to create what we call liquidity, right? Meaning that you will have at all moments, 24 hours, seven, almost a, a price to, um, to execute your desired transaction. So these are the, the three big players here, the dealers that put the, the banks and the corporates in contact, the, uh, the corporates that use the um, currency markets for risk, uh, for currency management purposes, and the banks. I can't, I can't help myself but to, to ask then. I mean, we have a, a whole question on what those contacts do and the, the way you, you guys work. But 
where does it sit in all this context? So we have three main actors, corporates, FX dealers, and financial institutions. And therefore, my, for my curiosity, where does context fit into all this? Right. Look, what Cantox offers is, as I said, a, a set of automated software solutions to handle the, uh, that end-to-end -end of management. It starts with all the way from pricing and then so channeling that uh, to the trade phase and, and then the post-trade phase. We call that end-to-end -end because, because and that's really, really important here. Some people argue for automation as a as what is called discrete automation, meaning you you solve one particular issue, but we really emphasize end to end automation, meaning integrate all the parts. To give you an example, if you are saving a few what's called pips, right, fractions of of those of those the difference between the the price at which you sell and which you buy. You, you may save them by automating trade phase of the workflow. But what if you're not integrating the pre-trade phase? That involves the process of exposure collection that we might discuss, right? But if you don't have a proper integration between those two, what you save on, on trading costs, you may lose on poorly managed uh, currency risk. So that's what we do now. Those solutions are based on on a technology that you want to go in, in, into that discussion. Well, it involves mostly APIs, right? Application programming interfaces—a fantastic piece of uh, of technology that enables us to provide those solutions. That was a great overview into the different aspects of currency management, currency risk management, etc. Moving forward, you you started to touch on the typical life cycle of an FX deal. You mentioned a little bit about pre-trade and post-trade and whatnot. Could you take us through that journey? So what is a typical life cycle of an FX deal starting at pre-trade? Right. Yes, absolutely. Look, it's a, a, a great point because it's, it's not mentioned for you in textbooks, right? In, you pick a textbook on currency management and then you have it. By magic, the exposure is there. All you need to do is to execute a hedge. But in real life, things are, of course, a lot more complicated, right? The, what we call exposure is, for example, on that, that budget forecast could be a piece of exposure, but also a farm sales order for which no invoice has still been issued. Or it could be an invoice, right? Uh, or an accounts receivable or an accounts payable. So there are different types of, of exposure. And that's why we give a lot of attention to the process of that pre-trade phase of gathering that information, collecting on that, that exposure. If, if I mention forecasts and then for farm sales orders and then invoices, in real life you will get that you will see that these pieces of information oftentimes are to be found in different company systems, right? Maybe on spreadsheets, if it's about broadcasts, maybe on your enterprise resource planning or ERP, if it's about sales or purchase orders, maybe in your treasury management system, if it's about invoices, right? And you need all those systems to be able to say, to communicate, to talk to each other in order for you to be able to gather that information, that exposure to currency risk. Note also that maybe headquarters has a fine process in place, but maybe the some subsidiaries do not. So all of this needs and needs to be to be managed. And is it is absolutely uh, so key to have all in its entire, entirety, right? All of the exposure information we collected and in a timely manner, as, as soon as possible if interest rates, especially if interest rates are in your favor. So it's a, that pre-trade phase include that process of exposure collection, but also what we call exposure validation. There must be exposure, I'm sorry, exposure processing that includes validation. Somebody has got to 
then there must be rules to for somebody to validate, right, to confirm that a hedge is got to be executed. And here we'll go back to to uh, Guillaume's example of a law straight at the start of the period, right? A very senior person in the organization must validate that trade because right? otherwise you could be in, in trouble. So processing the exposure involves rules to validate those trades and rules to aggregate also different uh, pieces of the exposure. So that's, in a nutshell, the pre-trade phase. We went then to trade phase. Mostly now it's done with those multi-dealer trading platforms. And then there's going to be what, what we call the post-trade phase, including accounting and, and of course, so all the process of reporting and analytics. If you can help me understand like what you mean by exposure in layman's terms, right? So is exposure gathering just sort of figuring out what the risks are for your company and whatever dealings you have coming into the future? It's kind of just for understanding where you might lose out due to external factors. Is that is that a good way to summarize it for Lehman? Yes, yes, it, it, it is, right? And it, it can be, that exposure can be, again, in the shape of a, just a forecast, right? And yeah. the, uh, it's typical for when budgeting takes place, it's a complicated process in which, uh, so purchasing managers, the, the, uh, the sales uh, teams are going to be involved, perhaps accountants, economists, lots of teams are going to, to come up with Excel spreadsheets in which all that information is so it's gathered. And when once the, so the budget uh, period is underway, it is vitally important to have a, a strong, a solid process to make those that, that calculation. Because, of course, if you want to manage the underlying currency risk, you need to know exactly how much to uh, to, to trade in, in forward markets. Right? But that exposure also could also be in the shape of firm sales orders. That's what happens at in the travel industry, right? We we don't advise to here to to hedge your exposure based on forecasts, but rather on firm sales or purchase orders. Or it could be for firms that are interested in just the accounting side of risk management, namely to to avoid excess, say, variability in your in your profit and loss in your income statement to hedge at the moment the invoices that are recognized in accounting terms are are so are, are issued. So there are different types of, of exposure to, to risk. Absolutely. No, very clear. And you mentioned earlier about netting your um, FX processes and, and instruments. Are you able to define that netting at the pre-trade phase or only afterwards? Very good point. Sometimes it's going to be it's got to be at the at the pre-trade phase, but it, it, again, remember that textbooks tell a very different story than than reality. And you, here, you, especially when you have to deal with many subsidiaries that have different so processes in place, and and but yes, of course, the effort must be very very clear from the beginning to have the best process in place together all that information. But netting could be, as I think, Hussein, you're, you're um, deducting from what I said earlier, right? That when you delay heads execution with the help of conditional orders, then you're going to find, and that's a very good point, right? Indeed, you might have more time to spot to incorporate those netting opportunities, which could be very important, right? Because say that headquarters is planning to sell whatever millions in dollars with a given value date, and suddenly it turns out that one uh, subsidiary plans to buy the same amount of dollars with the same value date. Why execute two hedges, right? It would be costly, It would, and it would force you to, to set aside cash or remember the collateral requirements of good faith or payments that you do beforehand. So to do it twice, it's uh, so it would be very costly. And indeed, 
netting is about that. And it's a way, again, right, that we at Cantox emphasize so to understand currency risk management in this case, not only as just executing hedges, right? Oh, great. Uh, and I think last point in, in the pre-trade phase is um, you need to get a rate given to you, right? So um, you mentioned earlier a little bit about competitive bidding or, or the different FX traders. Like, What's the process of actually getting a rate for your FX transaction? Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Hussain, for reminding you of that because I, I had, so um, maybe I had not mentioned that point. It's a very important one. In, in fact, it's incredibly exciting one. Again, Another case that you will not find on textbooks. Now, say that you are importing uh, furniture from China and you plan to sell that in the UK market, right? To your commercial team, the exchange rate between the pound and the, uh, and the dollar or the Chinese currency, depending on whether uh, in China is the phrase not to be settled in dollars, which is often the case, or in the local currency, right, becomes uh, a key element of all your business strategies. So it's absolutely vital to understand the process through which this uh, foreign exchange rate is obtained by the commercial team when they price their transaction. Again, easier said than done because there are many questions here. Where do you get that rate from? Do you get it from a website? Is it up to date? Do you get it from perhaps a central bank as most central banks do publish uh, exchange rates? Or do you get it from Bloomberg or from, say, Thomson Reuters, a financial service? Now, perhaps you might want to, uh, something that we could also discuss, you might like to use the forward rate instead of the spot rate to determine your price in your local currency. As there are interesting uh, differences uh, here. And also, you need to define how often are you going to source that rate. This ought to be once a day, and you say, give that to the, all the commercial team. Is it got to be once a day at three o'clock? But why at three o'clock and not at two o'clock? Or is it got to be uh, every week? Or you see, there are lots of, of possible way to, ways to, to do that. What we call a good ethics rate sourcing process is one in which the, the, the finance team, right? the, the, the treasury team, heeds so to say, commercial teams with the FX rates they need for pricing purposes. A rate could be, again, spot rate, or it could be the three-month forward rate or the six-month forward rate. It could include a markup, most likely higher rate or a lower rate, depending on your client size. So a, a good process will, uh, will provide the commercial team with all the rates they need, spot basis, forward basis, with the markups per client segment, per currency pair they desire, right? And that's, if it's done on a real-time basis, so much the better. It's going to allow the team to be a lot more competitive in terms of pricing. And look at what, what you will, will be achieving here, something that is more and more discussed now in in business is you're going to remove those silos, right? That that you have when the treasury team acts in isolation with respect to other teams. In this case, the, the commercial team, right? But what if you uh, allow them to cooperate? What if the process of sourcing the rate is exactly the way to remove those silos, that separation that is causing uh, so much trouble. Now, there's a an incredibly uh, uh, so exciting document or book, I, know, I, I should say, by consultants at Kinsey. They are calling for, if you can believe it, right, for $8 trillion in revenue growth uh, between now and the end of the decade. And it's got to go for those who are capable of removing those side and, um, and enhance their competitive advantage. Mac, you, you sometimes make treasury sound like poesy. I, I really love it. Um, that, <laughs> that's perfect. We, so we covered quite extensively uh, the pre-trade phase, right? What about the actual trade phase? How does a trade happen in the real life? 
Right. Look, once again, to go back to the the example of a of the US based company that has costs in dollars and it's called the so the, the functional currency that's the currency in which they have their costs in, the currency in which they present their financial statements, and they have a so a, a sale in a, a planned sale in in euros, right? And ideally, and it, it it happens all the time. Or the trade phase will, so the at the on the same date in which you are you are closing that transaction, that transaction is agreed upon. You are going to also sell the corresponding amount with a bank or with a bank, but through most likely a multi dealer trading platform with a value date that is set to coincide with the settlement of the commercial transaction. So here, the, uh, in the best case scenario, payments are not going to be much of an issue here because the cash that you receive from your commercial transaction is going to be used to settle your commercial transaction, your, your financial transaction. Remember that you had an agreement. Uh, we say an agreement; it's a contractual agreement. It's on the contract law, so it's you must execute, you must so comply with that agreement. You must so deliver those. Uh, 100,000 euros to the bank in exchange for which you will receive those, those dollars. And that's that's an ideally executed uh, payments process. But as I think we mentioned, right, sometimes these moments are not going to coincide. The cash flow moments of the commercial transaction might not exactly coincide with the process of, of, of sorry, with a validate of the financial transaction. That's why you need to uh, to have swaps in place. Now, swap execution, by the way, uh, Gil, is really interesting here because it could be a, when manually executed, very time consuming and, and resource intensive. And, it, it's, um, and you can make mistakes, right? Even the possibility of fraud or, or unethical behavior. So to the extent of possible, all of that process needs to be automated. And that's why also one feature that we include in, in currency management automation solutions. We definitely want to dig into this. Um, maybe just to close the loop before. So pre-trade, pretty clear. Uh, the actual trade, we just covered. What happens then after the trade? I believe there are quite some steps, right? Um, so what happens once the trade is done? And what type of reporting, including automation that you mentioned, can you walk us through this? Right, yes. That's an interesting point because Again, in, in people understand in, in one, what people understand in currency management stops at the trade phase. That's it. All the work is done. Bye. I can relax. I, here I can see the beach in front of me. I can go to the beach. And that's the end of my workflow. It's not the case. More work needs to be done, right? And it's going to involve, um, so, Accounting and reporting and analytics. And um, accounting here has uh, some presents some difficulties. For example, accountants are accountants are trained to recognize on their own on on the books of the company a, a transaction the minute the corresponding invoice has been issued. Right, that's their job, and they must do that. However, especially in the case of forecasted exposures, perhaps you executed the corresponding forward transaction before the moment that the invoice is recognized on company books. That can create confusion, right? Because accountants also must record the change in the value of that forward instrument. So you can have a perfectly normal situation in which you would have of origin gain from your commercial exposure that is not yet recognized because the corresponding invoice has not been issued. Yet, you have a foreign exchange loss. Remember that a hedge is a, the offsetting transaction. One goes in one direction, the other in the other direction. So you could have conceivably a loss in your forward position, corresponding loss. Remember, they're going to cancel each other. One is not recognized while the other is. That creates uh, some confusion. Spam CEOs are, they don't want to see that. They don't understand their sources 
of these changes. And so they are accounting uh, uh, principles that allow you to go hedge accounting, new accounting standards that allow companies to take away those foreign exchange gains and losses from the PL and put it temporarily in other accounts. But it requires, of course, lots of of hours of work of for accountants is time consuming. It's an expensive process. At least, what can be automated is the process of of compiling all that information. Right, that can be also automated. Remember that we tend to have we have kind of well the favorable view of automation. We always say that automation removes tasks, not jobs. <laughs> so there is a, a good example also to automate the the process of compiling all that information. Now, when it comes to reporting and analytics, that's an, another matter. That's more for internal purposes to assess your performance, to assess how well your hedges are working, your KPIs or key. So uh, that is going to... Performance indicator. Yeah, that's it. Performance indicator, thank you. Um, and that is going to evolve, of course, depending on the type of program, the distance, mm -hmm. Uh, to the hedge rate or the the, the PNL, the interest rate impact, all of that. You need, or in the ideal world, of course, we want a reporting system that allows us to that allow us to have all that information on a real time basis, available on a real time basis. What's your the impact of of hedges, or what is the biggest source of risk, or how well you are, are performing, and all of that needs to be uh, so in such a way that is easy to understand, uh, easy to read with data segregation capabilities. Perhaps it's very sensitive information that not everybody must see. And for that, uh, so there's an important aspect of, of currency management as well. One is that is, again, disregarded in mostly in in textbooks, but in real life, believe me, it plays an important role. I think the last year's HSBC survey pointed out to pointed that about eighty percent of of CFOs would like to have at their disposal better analytics systems, and that's also made possible with currency management automation solution. Awesome. Just there is a concept that it took me a while uh, to wrap my head around, which is FX gain and loss. So if I understand it correctly, when you hedge yourself against an FX risk, and if the movement between the two currencies indeed goes down like against you, but you hedge yourself, you make a gain because if you would have not hedged, you would have made a loss. And you actually need to declare that profit in your PL. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes, absolutely. And the way to think about this is mostly that. Remember that one is going to cancel the other, right? So mm -hmm. to go back to the example of the U.S. producer with sales in, in euros, if the euro depreciates, right? And when those euros are going to be translated, because there is a time lapse between the moment the transaction is agreed and the moment it's going to be settled in cash. If the euro depreciates during that time lapse, the, the value of your commercial transaction is going to, to diminish. But but the opposite is going to happen to the value of your forward transaction because you sold those euros in the first place, right? So, and you've got to get a, a lower exchange rate, which is going to create a foreign exchange gain offsetting that foreign exchange loss. Now, the you know, thing to take into account here is that interest rates are here play a role. Yes, that's one of the most... Um, Technical and complicated are parts, but if I could uh, summarize it in non-technical terms for your audience, it would be the following. There are, of course, currencies that are seen as safer, right, than others. <laughs> currencies that are seen as riskier than others. Example is, of course, the Swiss franc, widely seen as the most, uh, as the strongest uh, currency. Now, because of that low risk perception, interest rates in Swiss francs are very low, almost nil, right? And 
If you take interest rates on, say, an emerging market currency where risk is perceived as being higher, interest rates are going to be higher. And that creates a difference between the spot rate and the forward rate. And it's going to have an impact on those for net foreign exchange gains and losses that, that you mentioned, Guillaume. So, for example, in this case, if a Swiss-based company sells Mexican pesos on a forward basis, because the Mexican peso is widely seen as riskier than Swiss franc, so the company is not going to get as much Swiss francs as it would in the spot market. That creates what we call a high cost of hedging. And yes, it's, and it's going to have a, an impact on those net foreign exchange gains and losses, right? Sometimes it's got to be, be in your favor. We call that favorable forward points. Uh, the forward points are the difference between the spot and the forward rate or unfavorable forward points. Thanks so much, Augustine, for taking us through the, the whole trade life cycle as well. Just to start bringing things to a close, could you take us through in a little bit more detail uh, what Cantox does and how they integrate into this whole process? You mentioned earlier about you know, where you sit with the FX and the and the banks and the corporates. Could you give us an example of something that Cantox has implemented or done that sort of highlights what you guys do in that whole process? Yes, of course. Um, yes, the, the case here uh, would be the one with, a, say, a French company it's called Thea Thamai. It's a, a mid-sized European pharmaceutical company in the specialty chemical area. Now, uh, they happen to, to sell in emerging markets and that creates a relation with, with what you just said, right? The, if they're based in, in France and the euro is their functional currency in which they have their costs and in which they present their financial statements, it's a relatively strong currency uh, as opposed to uh, weaker currencies, say, in Brazil, maybe in South Africa and Mexico. So that creates a, what we call the high cost of hedging because Remember, as those currencies are seen as riskier, when they hedge, they are going to get uh, paid less in the forward markets than in, in, in the spot rate. So that creates a cost. And the way to handle this is to put in place an automated program that allows them to delay the execution of those hedges, right? And that's done. That requires, so from their part, to be able to gather all of their exposure to currency risk in so from subsidiaries, from headquarters, in a timely manner, in a complete manner. And this is done with the help of all of our solution, mostly Cantox Dynamic Hedging, which got to, to source that information from the uh, from in this case the treasury management system of the Afama and is going to Route that information to uh, to the um, the multi dealer trading platforms in in a way that is already uh, uh, so the, the information is gathered and processed in such a way that conditional orders are in place in order to to delay the execution of hedges to avoid that negative impact from interest rates. Remember that it sounds like just a one or two conditional orders, but it's going to take much more than that because these um, forwards are executed, the exposure needs to be adjusted and it needs to be very precise and automated. Now, the process also has, so the company has saved on those financial costs by delaying the execution of the hedges while still having the their risk under active management, right? So they are their exposure to the to currency risk under active management. So the, the risk is uh, taken care of, even though hedge execution if the, is delayed. They has also allowed the company to, to remove those time-consuming or resource-intensive and repetitive tasks uh, performed by, by, by members of, of the, the treasury team. And as that has allowed them to save on those, on those costs. We'd like to 
think uh, here in terms of, of risk, cost, and growth. And the growth aspect is where we lay more importance, right? Because think of what happens when you have all these processes in place, right? And we, you have most of them automated. And remember that we're keen to emphasize that automation removes tasks and not jobs. Why is that? Because now the, the treasury team of Teafama has more time at their disposal to devote to value-adding tasks, such as so scaling to more currency pairs if needed, right? To always be in a position to operate in the most convenient or most profitable currency, which they want, given the size of the treasury team, they were not able to do uh, before the Cantor solution. So they, they decided to stick to a core group of currencies and leave the other ways, the others uh, untouched. But now, all of those time consuming and resource intensive so aspects of manually executing those tasks, tasks are removed and they have more time to devote to, to those uh, value adding tasks, especially. Uh, so thinking in terms of, of growth, of expansion, we really want to emphasize that part because with risk under currency risk under management, you want, you will be in a position to confidently well, tackle your markets and pocket sometimes those mock-ups that, that are charged by clients when they don't uh, use their own currencies or you're able to remove also those FX markups when you buy and you end up also well, selling dearer and buying cheaper. So protecting and enhancing your profit margins. So all of this is is what we do, or, and all day long we analyze so the situations with companies. Remember that their pricing characteristics is maybe the, the one defining aspect of how we're going to, uh, to interact with them and what type of, of program we're going to propose. We, we like to get into the nitty-gritty details of integration and implementation. Um, what are the tools and system you actually integrate with? You, you said you were like, streamlining the process of this exposure gathering and processing and interfacing directly with the FX dealers. But on the corporate side, are you looking to the ERP then, where the AP and AR are um, populated and therefore the exposure gathered? Or the, is it the TMS? Where does Contox fit into this? Yes, absolutely. Look, this is, of course, a, a key point, right? The, well, it's, it's got to depend on the different nature of of the of the exposure that you want to to manage, so most of the times the forecasts are going to sit in company spreadsheets. The uh, firm sales orders are going to be at your um, disposal on ERP of the company. Perhaps these invoices are going to sit on the treasury management system. So you need what what is called software to software interfaces that allow the systems to communicate one another. And they're called application programming interfaces. An absolutely key uh, piece of technology that is, of course, so powering all of our, of our solutions because that's what enables those systems to communicate with each other. It's very important when you have, for example, combinations of hedging programs. You want to hedge your budget and exposure, yes, perhaps about to I'm going to take one big trade at the start and put conditional orders on the rest of the exposure. But you want to also hedge the incoming farm sales orders. That's a fantastic combination that allows you to so to hedge those um, farm sales orders as they uh, as they are as they materialize. And the minute they materialize, you adjust the rest of the exposure. So you end up almost now completely. So forgetting about the risk of, of overhedging, but this must be uh, done with these technology solutions, these application programming interfaces that are so vital, but not only in hedging, right? They are very important in pricing as well, right? Because when um, the treasury team, no, no, I'm sorry, the commercial team, they require their FX rates. Remember, they could be the part of the forward rates. It could have markups per client segment and per currency pair. This information is 
transmitted to them also through application programming interfaces. And last but not least, it also is used in, in the post trade phase, right? As you want to be able to have what we call traceability. You want to uh, have a system that allows you to trace all the individual small hedges back to their, to the forecasted exposure, right? Because you need to make the necessary adjustments or you need to perform the accounting tasks that, that correspond. And again here, as in reporting, um, so those APIs uh, play a key role. This definitely the most, uh, the most important piece of technology that, again, allows systems to, to communicate, to talk to each other in a way that makes the, that seamless integration possible. Otherwise, of course, it wouldn't be possible. We would still have fragmented um, so, um, process of, different processes of automation in, in different phases of the workflow. Very clear. Um, obviously, to wrap up, I think this was an absolute masterclass in, in currency management overall and risk management. So thank you so, so much. I'm sure our listeners got a lot out of it. Um, if you could summarize, just to, to finish the episode, uh, currency risk management in one key lesson for, for new treasurers out there or for people getting into this topic, uh, how would you just summarize into, into one, one key lesson? Right, I would use management. Yes, then I would use two words: embrace currencies. Yeah, that's that's our our key motto here. Beyond all the technicalities, right? application programming interfaces, spas and the forwards, the uh, the interest rate differentials, exposure gathering and and uh, trade execution. It doesn't uh, what well, it pales in comparison with the importance of the business side of, of automation, right? It's about growth, about trying to capture those growth opportunities to protect and enhance your competitive position to maybe get the chance to improve your profit margins, to raise the sales to assets ratio, and to make a contribution towards enhancing the value of the firm because ultimately that's the task of on the of treasury team. So I would summarize in these two words, embrace currencies with confidence if you're able to, to manage the process in its entirety. That's great. And, and just to finish, uh, where can people go to know more about you, Cantox, Currency Cast? Where should they go to find out more? Right. Um, the best way is to uh, to go through our, uh, to our web website, so uh, cantox.com, and there you have, you will find all the material or the the possibilities to to have a a, um, a conversation with our currency management specialists and also to have access to lots of different materials and of course to to currency cast. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes below. Augustine, thank you so much. All right. Uh, thanks you. It was really a pleasure to be uh, uh, with you and we'll see you next time. <laughs>